Good morning. We may not have snakes, but depending on who's speaking, this might be the splash zone. So, sorry guys. That's why they don't have me come out here all that often. Now, my name is Jonathan Brocious. I'm the campus pastor of New Hope Newton, and it's great to be here with you guys on a Sunday morning. I don't get to do that all that often, so it's just great to be here and worship with you. Um, but Tyler took us last week, we've been working through Christless Christianity, and last week we talked about moralism, right? That belief, that idea that we all kind of operate with until somebody uh, tells us otherwise, that if we're just good enough, if we check the right boxes, if we, if we get through life and get all the right things done, that we can, we can make ourselves acceptable to God, that God's not really got anything against us, you know, he's just waiting for us to kind of come to the right places. And then he just bulldozed that whole idea with the rat squirrel thing, right? You know, we're all sitting there going, oh gosh, I feel like a great person after that message. You know, I'm a rat, not a squirrel. Well, today I want to talk to you about the therapeutic God that a whole lot of us worship. We've been talking about moralistic, therapeutic deism, big college-sounding words, so I'm going to take that big college-sounding word and try to break it down. Let's really take something home today. Therapeutic God, what is it? It's the idea, again, it's just like moralism. We just kind of operate this way by default until someone tells us different. But the therapeutic God idea says that the reason God's in our lives is to solve our problems. We've got issues. We've got things going wrong in our life. God is here to help you solve those problems. And the clearest way I can think to, to show you what I'm talking about is to hop in the Wayback Machine, and I want to see a show of hands real quick. Who here, probably everybody over the age of 30, maybe even 25, but who here remembers September 11th, 2001? Who here remembers exactly where they were when they heard that news? Yeah, almost everybody's got their hands up. Good. I remember where I was. I was uh, taking a math test, actually. So since I'm homeschooled, that meant I was in my bedroom. <laughs> True story. So I'm sitting there, and I'm at my little desk, you know, and I'm plowing through my algebra test because, yes, homeschoolers do learn algebra. So I'm sitting there, and I'm plowing through this algebra test, and uh, all of a sudden, my little brother tears into the room and he goes, an airplane just hit the World Trade Center. And I didn't believe him because number one, that's crazy. And number two, he's your little brother. Never believe your little brother. And he said, no, mom's got the TV on. And I knew then that he was serious because mom hated TV. She never watched TV. So if mom's watching the TV, there's got to be something big going down. And so we fly into the family room and we're all sitting there and we're watching in horror as a second airplane. I remember watching it live on TV. That image is just burned in my mind. You know what I'm talking about? Watching live on TV as a second airplane hit. And then the third airplane hits the Pentagon and then we started to get nervous because my family lived about one hour outside of Washington, D.C., and my dad drove through Beltway traffic every day to get to work, and so all of a sudden we're trying to call dad. This is before we had cell phones, and so we're trying on the landline, but of course the whole phone system across the country is melting down because everyone's trying to contact everybody, right? It was a horrible day. It was the day our nation came under attack. My dad was fine, by the way. I realize I just left you all in suspense there. <laughs> But it was a horrible day. It was the day our whole nation came under attack. We were faced with raw evil. We were faced with death. We were faced with loss. We were faced with just suffering. I remember those, those newspaper and those magazine covers. You know, all those images are just stuck in our minds. And it's a crazy thing. Five days later, September 16th, church attendance spiked. You know, I don't know about out here in the Midwest, but out east, we had God Bless America bumper stickers just pop up all over the place. Politicians and news anchors all of a sudden end every, every speech, every newscast with, and God bless America, you know. All of a sudden, our nation, when we're faced with these huge problems of evil, death, pain, loss, suffering, all of a sudden, we come running to God. And we're saying, God, I don't have a box for this. I don't have a part in my mind where I can just say, oh yeah, okay, now I understand it. We had, it blew our minds. We had no idea. And as a nation, we all came to God and said, God, help us with this problem. And that's the therapeutic God mindset. And that's where an awful lot of us start our relationship with God. A lot of you may even be in this room for the first time because you hit some kind of a problem. 
Maybe it wasn't September 11th, but maybe it was a family issue or a marriage issue or finances, or maybe your career took a nosedive. I don't know what it was, but very few people wake up all of a sudden and say, you know, life's just going great. I think I need to go to church. You know, everybody, we start with God because we have some kind of issue. And if you're here and that's why you're here, I want to say welcome to you. I want to say that this book that I hold so dear, that this church holds so dear, tells us all kinds of promises and stories about a God that loves you, a God that wants to walk through this issue with you, and a God that gave his life for you. But here's the problem, here's the twist with the therapeutic God mindset. There's some real problems. Number one, it doesn't lead to lasting life change. They actually did a study on September 11th. I want to finish that story. They did a study on the spiritual and religious impact of 9-11, and they found nothing. They did a study, and they said that by the time November came around, two months after the attacks, church attendance was right back to where it was. I don't know about you guys. I don't see those God Bless America bumper stickers anymore. (laughs) And I don't see any news anchors or politicians ending their speeches that way either. All, what happened was the pain, that problem, that raw moment passed. We got busy again and just fell right back into our old ways. That's the problem with the therapeutic God mindset. That's problem number one. Number two, number two problem with the therapeutic God mindset is that there's an awful lot of times, I don't know about you guys, but I've experienced this many times, where we're coming to God with a problem, we're coming to God with an issue that we need answered, and we need God to come through for us, and it doesn't feel like he shows up. Or he operates in a way that's completely unexpected. He operates in a way that we don't like, frankly, sometimes. And that's when it messes with our therapeutic God mindset. God's our therapist. God's there to help us with our issues. All of a sudden, he's not coming through. And I want to tell you a story. It comes from Matthew chapter 16. I want to tell you a story about a time that the apostle Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, had a moment like that. So flip with me to Matthew 16, verse 21, and a little background on this. Jesus, when he came to this planet, he's walking around, he's doing all these crazy things, healing people, making some miracles happen, and he becomes really kind of a rock star of his day. He is a total celebrity, and he's on the front of every tabloid, and his YouTube videos have millions of hits. Why? Because the Jewish people at that time were oppressed. They were occupied by the Roman Empire. The Romans had, were ruling their people. They, all their political figures were just puppets of the Roman Empire. There was nothing they could do. They were basically enslaved, and they were looking for this Messiah, this guy that was promised in the Old Testament prophecies to come and set them free. And here's Jesus, and he's checking all the boxes, and he's fulfilling all these prophecies, and he's showing just crazy power. And there are crowds of thousands of people following Jesus because they're just waiting for that moment when he marches in, and And he says, this place is mine, I'm king now. And so Jesus takes his disciples off to the side, and he's telling them this little like secret plan here. And this is where we start in verse 21 of chapter 16 of Matthew. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show his disciples, okay, so he's showing them the game plan, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests. This is where question marks start kind of floating above their heads, right? They're not getting this and the scribes, and be killed, now they're really lost, and be raised up on the third day. He's like, hey guys, here's my secret plan. Here's how I'm going to save the world. This is how it's going to happen. I'm going to go, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to come back on the third day. And they're going, whoa, you were supposed to come over here and solve our problems. You were supposed to be here to come through for us. You were supposed to be the ruling figure that set us free, and you're going to be killed and raised again on the third day? That's a cool parlor trick but I don't really understand how that's going to help me. So the apostle Peter addresses the issue. He says, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. Here's Peter. He's operating with this set of plans, with this idea, these sets of problems, and here's Jesus revealing what he's got for him, and they don't match up. 
And he's going, God, this, isn't, this does not click. This is not working. Jesus says, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Here's a pro tip for you. When Jesus calls you Satan, you better stop. <laughs> Just chill out, man. Just chill out. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. That's the heart of the issue right there. When we're cruising along with this therapeutic God mindset, when God is in our life to solve our problems, we're coming to God and we're just operating out of our agenda. We're operating out of what we have, what we want, what we need, what we desire, our dreams, right? God, here, help me with this, help me with this, help me with this. And God's saying, hey, here's what I got for you. Put your mind on my interests, on what I want. And Jesus keeps talking. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That cross that Jesus is referring to, they all knew what he meant. Because a lot of people died on crosses before Jesus did. It was a common tool that the Romans used to execute people. Our version today is the electric chair. Jesus is saying, hey, you want what I have for you? You want to be a part of what I'm doing? You want to be a part of my plan? You want to be a part of my kingdom? Get ready. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to say no to yourself. None of us like that, right? Climb into your electric chair, strap in, and follow me. It's a tough call that he's laying in front of us. It's a tough call that he's laying in front of his disciples. And so Jesus follows this up and he explains it a little bit more. He says, for whoever wishes to save his life shall lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. It's one of those things where as you sit in it, you're going, I, this makes absolutely no sense. This is totally backwards. And then as you think about it and think about it, all of a sudden you're going, I'm getting it now. Whoever wishes to save his life, well, who doesn't want to save their life? Right? Who doesn't want to see their dreams come true? Who doesn't want to see their goals accomplished? Who doesn't want to see their families happy, their marriages thrive? Who doesn't want to see their bank accounts do well? Who doesn't want these things? But if that's our primary goal, if that is what we're here for, we're going to lose everything. But whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying if the point of your life if the reason you're here, if the way you operate through your day, if the point is you, you will lose everything that matters. But if the point of your life is Jesus, if it's all about his plans, his goals, his dreams, his ideas for this planet, you will find that nothing else actually matters at all. If the point of your life is you, you will lose everything that matters. But if the point of your life is Jesus, you'll find that nothing else matters at all. I was trying to think of a word picture to like explain this so you guys could just see it and, and, and understand exactly what I'm talking about. And the one I came up with uh, takes us a little bit into, uh, into nerd land. So you're going to have to go there with me for a little bit, Okay. Here's the deal, my dad was an amateur, or is an amateur astronomer, and when I say amateur, all I mean by that is it never paid any bills, but he was big into this stuff, and he bought telescopes, and we looked at stuff in the stars all the time, and I learned so much about our galaxy and all, these, all this crazy stuff. And so anyway, one of the things that I learned about, and you did too in school, is the solar system. And one of the images that we studied was something that looked pretty similar to this, it's got the sun right there in the middle, right? And we've got all these planets swinging around the sun. We used to have nine of them, but, you know, now we have eight because science. <laughs> no good reason. I have no idea. Anyway, Pluto's still there. It's now a dwarf planet. But we have these planets swinging around the sun. And that picture right there that we're looking at, that theory of looking at our solar system is actually new. I learned this as I was just rolling through with my dad on a whole bunch of stuff, but the, what, this way of looking at the universe, this way of looking at our solar system is like three, four hundred years old. It's really not all that, all that 
it's pretty earth shattering, really, because astronomy has been around for thousands of years. This has only been around for 400 years. This is called the heliocentric system. It's helio meaning sun, centric meaning centered. So they've got the heliocentric system of the sun. Before that, we had the geocentric system, meaning earth centered. And if you think about it, it makes an awful lot of sense. Rewind the clock 2,000 years, you're an ancient Greek astronomer. And uh, because you're interested in the stars, you wake up early one morning, you strap on your toga, and you go out in your front yard. And you're standing there, you're facing east, right? And what comes up before you? It's about 6 o'clock in the morning, right? The sun. The sun comes up, and you continue to stand there for a while. And so you're standing there, and before you know it, the sun travels all the way over your head, sets behind you. Well, because they haven't invented Netflix yet, you're interested, so you keep standing there. And so you're standing there, and all of a sudden here comes the moon, and then here comes the stars, and they take the same path. They come up on the east, and then they set in the west, and you see stars, and you watch them travel, and they go right around. And you're going, huh, well, I haven't moved. I've been standing here all day in my toga. That tree has been staying there the whole time. Nothing's moved. Therefore, everything must be revolving around me because I haven't moved one bit. So everything is going around the earth. Everything's going this way. That system totally worked for a long time until they noticed that there were a few stars that didn't click with the rest of the system. They're sitting there, and they keep wandering back and forth. Most stars just go in a complete circle right around you, but these stars, they start moving back and forth. Sometimes they'll come up one day, and they're like over here all of a sudden, and that's, they call them wanderers, and that's actually where we get the, the word planet from. It means wanderer, and so these stars are just jumping all over the sky, not making any sense at all, and so the ancient Greek astronomers, they're sitting down, they're like, okay, we have to figure out a way how do we explain these planets? How do we explain these wandering stars? And so they came up with a diagram or a graph that looks something like this. This is the geocentric system. They've got all these planets, and they're spinning around us, but they don't spin in circles. They spin in these crazy loop-de-loop -loop spiral things. And that explains how they wander all over the place. The point I'm trying to make is this. We wake up. We go through our lives. We go to work. We tend to our families, we come home, we crash, we wake up, we do this routine over and over and over again. And before we know it, we are at the center of our world. And we've got all these crazy things spinning all the way around us. And we've got our wife over here, we've got our husband over here, we've got our kids over here, we've got our money over here, we've got our job trying to go. And we've got all this stuff just doing these crazy spirals. And it doesn't make any sense. And we're trying to make it all work. And we're trying to hang on to all of it. And then we come to God and we say, God, help me. I've got problems. I have issues. I need you to help me. And then God and church just becomes one more of these things that's just spinning all over the place. And we are stuck and we can't keep track of all of it and we it doesn't help us and we're broken and God is saying look I have promises I have answers I have solutions I want to come alongside you but you have the wrong center to your universe you're looking at this all wrong we've got the wrong system We've got the wrong playbook. We're operating with us at the middle. Our dreams, our agendas, our desires, our plans, our goals, they're all right there, and that's what we're focused on. And Jesus is saying, I've got something else going on over here. He's inviting us to come. That's what Jesus was doing here in Matthew 16. He's inviting us to come and put him at the middle and watch everything else, including ourselves and our plans and our agendas and dreams and desires to spin around him. The Apostle Paul talks about this also. Romans chapter 12 was written to the Jews who were living in Rome at the time. And uh, Paul writes this. He says, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. As soon as those Jews heard the word spiritual service of worship, they keyed in on that because they knew that when Paul was saying that, he's saying this is what your relationship with God should look like. This is how you guys are supposed to do the tango and dance. This is how you operate when it comes to God. And they say, okay, what is it? Oh, I'm supposed to be a living sacrifice. We hear that today 
And we think that sounds kind of poetic almost, you know? The Jews heard that, and they're going, ugh. Because they'd read Leviticus. They'd operated with that old temple system of sacrifices, and they knew what it looked like. I don't know if you guys have ever read the book of Leviticus, but I have, and here's the TLDR. Doesn't go well for the sacrifice. These sacrifices are killed. These sacrifices are burned. These sacrifices are bled out. These sacrifices are poured out. They are completely consumed. Why? All for the glory of God. And that's what the Apostle Paul is inviting you and he's inviting me to walk with him on this journey of being a sacrifice. He's inviting us to take our families, take our lives, take our visions, our dreams, our desires, our goals, our careers, our money, our everything, and lay it on the altar to be completely burned up, to be completely consumed, to be completely used all the way through. Why? For the glory of God. That's supposed to be the center of our universe. Nothing else. And the Apostle Paul proceeded to live this out. Once Jesus got a hold of the Apostle Paul's life, he left it all. He left position, he left status, he left money, he left all of it, and he went on this crazy journey. And guess what? He was stoned twice for what he believes. That means people threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. That he was shipwrecked a couple of times. He was bitten by poisonous snakes. You read the book of Acts, this guy went through hell and back, all for the glory of God. And he's inviting us to do the same thing. At the, towards the end of his life, he writes the book of Philippians. And he's actually in jail at this point. And he is writing this book. And I love these words that he puts in here. He says, for I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance. He's talking about his position right there in jail, guards on either side, waiting to go see Caesar, the emperor of Rome, the ruler of the known world at the time, and tell him about Jesus. So he's got a lot of pressure on him, and he's saying, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. Through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope. I love that, earnest expectation and hope. He's saying, look, I know I'm getting towards the end. I know I'm getting towards the finale, and this is what I want more than anything. This is my highest goal. This is what my life is about. This is my earnest expectation and hope. What is it, Paul? It is that I shall not be put to shame in anything. I don't want to flame out at the end. I don't want to burn out at the end. I don't want to lose it and wreck into the wall right there as I'm about to cross the finish line, but that with all boldness, I want to stay strong. I want to push through. Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. The Apostle Paul is saying, I might make it, I might not, but it doesn't matter as long as Christ is glorified. I might be rich, I might be poor. It doesn't matter as long as Christ is glorified. I might be free or I might rot in this prison for the rest of my life. It doesn't matter as long as Christ is glorified through what I am doing. And he's inviting you and me to do the same thing. And it's a hard decision. I'll never forget when it smacked me right between the eyes. I walked out of college and uh, graduated from college, went straight into a ministry job, and you fast forward the clock three or four years, and I'm a broken, broke, (laughs) frustrated, and frustrated is not even the right word, I'm an angry young man because things had not turned out the way I thought they would. And I uh, look at my friends that graduated from the same school at the same time, and they started careers, and their families look happy, and I'm in this desperate place, and I'm having to scrap to get through each month and trying to figure out what am I doing. And uh, I remember distinctly the conversation I had with a friend of mine where I said, I want to make money now. 
I've had it with this. I did what God wanted me to do. I did what I was supposed to do. I walked into there and I thought I operated the best I knew how. And look what I've got now because of this. And I said, and I want to make money now. And it wasn't like I woke up and I said, you know what, I'm done with Jesus. It wasn't like I woke up and said, I'm done with God. He's no longer part of my life. I don't believe in him anymore. It wasn't, I didn't say any of those things. I still went to church. I still loved Jesus. But in that moment, my heart took a shift and took a turn, and I got the wrong thing at the center of my universe. A business opportunity came along, a chance to be part owner of a new company, and I hustled for a year and a half, and I grounded out for a year and a half, and I was still working almost full-time at that ministry because that was what was, you know, keeping any gas in the tank at all, and then I was working at this several, you know, all the time, and then I was still doing one other thing a few hours a week. I was gone all the time. We had one car, and I was in it constantly, driving all over the place, and never noticed that right behind me there's a young wife and two small little girls that are just shriveling up and dying on the vine. And I'll never forget when I realized where I was. Johanna had come out here to visit her parents for a couple weeks. And towards the end of that visit, we were talking on the phone. And uh, I don't remember how, but somehow we started talking about where we were and what we were doing and how things were going. And I'll never forget, she said, Jonathan, and she's crying. I have no idea how to respond, you know. Anybody else been there? <laughs> She's crying. I'm sitting there. I'm going. And she goes, I don't know how much longer I can take it. I scared me to death. I thought I was about to lose my marriage. So I called my dad. And I called dad and I said, dad, I don't know what to do. I think she's going to leave me. I've, I've been trying so hard. I've been working so hard. And he goes, Jonathan, your marriage is more important than this business. Message received, Jonathan, you've got the wrong center to your universe. Jonathan, you're pushing so hard, you're working so hard, you're hustling and grinding it out. Why? Because you want to be comfortable. Because you're tired of being broke. Because you're tired of this just nasty place that you feel. You just want you. It's about you, Jonathan. If your life is about you, you will lose everything that matters. And I was right there on the edge of that cliff. I was right there about to lose it. I was trying so hard to save my life. I was trying so hard to make something out of it. And I ran the risk of losing all of it. But praise God, he is a God of second chances. Amen? And he gave me one of them. And we closed up shop and moved out here and started over from scratch. This time with the right center to our universe. And we found that nothing else really even matters. <laughs> nothing else matters at all. I want to give you guys a few concrete things to think about as you're wrestling with this decision in your life. And I don't, this, these are just things I thought of just from my own experience and from what I've been through. But number one, what is coming out of your mouth? What do you talk about and how do you talk about it? That moment when I said, I want to make money. Whom? It shows you right there where my heart was. The Bible talks about our mouths being like a keyhole to see into our hearts and into seeing what we are all about. And that is certainly true for me. And that moment when I said those things, it showed me that my, comfortable, my comfort was at the center of my heart. It was at the center of my universe. And it's crazy the way we talk about things, isn't it? When we talk about it and we say, oh, my spouse, my wife, my husband, they complete me. Or we say, my children just make my world go round. Or we say, oh, that church feeds me. Man, we have so many sentences that are centered on I and me and what I am doing and what I want and desire and need. What if we reframed those sentences? What if we flipped them around? What if our wives, what if our husbands were an opportunity to serve someone else and make them more like Jesus on this planet? 
What if our kids, what if our families were not something that we had to shelter and protect and try to keep away from the rest of the world, but what if it was an opportunity to love and invest into those people so that the world would see us doing that and realize we have a God, we have a Father that loves us? What if our church was an opportunity to go and serve the body of Christ? What if we flipped centers? What if we changed up why we were doing what we were doing? Next thing, what frustrates you? What makes you angry? Frustration and anger is an indicator showing that we have expectations up here and reality is coming in down here. And so when you get angry, when you get frustrated, you can look at that and instantly know what your expectations are. You can instantly know what you expect out of this planet. And if you're looking at that and all of those expectations are based on you, we got a problem. What occupies your time? Look at your calendar. You can immediately see, I devote so many hours to this, and I neglect that. You can tell what's important to you. How about your money? Same thing. This is not a message about time management or finances, but those things are indicator lights that show you what's at the center of your heart. Look at those. Take stock in those and ask yourself, what is the point of my life? When I wake up and I just move through my day, What is my center? It's a question I want you to wrestle with today. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask all of you to take a second here and actually look straight down at the floor in between your feet. I don't want you looking at anybody else. I don't want you you to look around the room. I want this to be a second where you can take a moment And work through this in your heart with God. And I want you to look at those filters. What's coming out of your mouth? What makes you angry? What occupies your time? And what occupies your money? And take a self-analysis and ask yourself, what is the middle of my universe right now? What is my world about right now? If the point of your life is you, you will lose everything that matters. But if the point of your life is Jesus, you will find that nothing else matters at all. So what's at the point? What's the point of your life? Why do you do what you do? What's at the center of it all? Is God just in your life to solve your problems? Or are you here as a living sacrifice to be burned up, to be used up, to be bled out, to be poured out, completely consumed for the glory of Jesus? Then the second question I want you to ask yourself is, are you willing to be that living sacrifice? First, you got to figure out where you're at now. Second, you got to ask yourself, am I willing to be that living sacrifice? Am I willing to put Jesus at the center of my universe? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have some music. And I don't want you to stand and sing, at least not at first. What I want you to do is I want you to look at the floor and I want you to wrestle through that right now with God, just you and God. And you're having this conversation, you and him, and he's revealing what's in your heart and you're making that decision. And I'm here to tell you, this is a daily decision. This is something you're gonna have to do over and over and over again. And so today might be the first time but it's gonna be the first time of thousands that you make this decision. A decision to say, Jesus, I want you to be at the middle of my universe. My life is about you and it's not about me. I am willing to take up my cross and follow you. I am willing to be that living sacrifice. And if you get to that spot where you are willing to be a living sacrifice, then stand up and sing with us. If you're not, stay seated. And you know what? If you stay seated, that's okay because that means you're honest. And this is a decision that requires honesty. This is a decision that requires you to get to a point where you are willing to do whatever it takes. So that's what we're going to do. Lucas is going to play, and I want you to stay seated and wrestle with that decision. Are you willing to be a living sacrifice?